Yes, I do. And okay. Dr. Block, what do, what do you think of the analysis, uh, his analysis of why the government should have this power? Well, I don't think they should have the power. I think it's a violation of contract. Uh, you know, uh, we believe in capitalist acts between consenting adults, and the idea of putting people in jail for offering a wage below a stipulated minimum uh, and that people agree to uh, just seems very unconscionable to me. But what I wanted to do is get into this blinder uh, comment. What he said is a modest increase, mm. and he also said, that a 10 percent increase will only increase uh, 10 percent increase will only increase the unemployment by one to three percent. Well, one to three percent is you know one to three percent too many, and also it depends upon the time elapsed. As I said, when something occurs, the market doesn't react immediately. Uh, they they to get that three percent or one percent, uh, the lag was very short. But if time goes on, then it'll be bigger. But look, you see, Blunder says a modest increase, so you're talking 10 percent, but why should it be a 10%? If it's really a floor in the wages, why not raise it to $100 an hour? Now, Blender or Stiglitz or any of those um, uh, very famous economists who uh, misunderstand economics, they would be appalled. This is an utter refutation. Now, look, uh, when, I, uh, when I say that it's absolute necessity that the minimum wage law will create unemployment, I'm not saying by definition. I'm saying based on the logic of it. And the logic is time immemorial. It doesn't change over time. If you're, assuming, if you're assuming profit maximizing behavior and the wage is higher than uh, the um, uh, productivity, th then the guy can't keep his job. It's just a matter of uh, finding out alternative arrangements. Now look, the reason older workers aren't affected is because older workers have higher productivity and they can jump over the hurdle. It's younger workers who can't. That's why you have to have an exception. The teenage minimum wage is, I don't know, something like $2 an hour, whereas uh, uh, two or three. Well, I'm going to cut you off right here because I, I don't know that Dr. Bernstein can be on the last uh, part. So you have about 30 seconds, Dr. Bernstein, to, to sum up. Sure. To sum, sum yourself up. Sure. First of all, uh, the uh, uh, one to three percent, as I mentioned, that I, I didn't get it. I, I didn't. I wasn't able to finish. That's the old research. The new research, which actually looks carefully at these empirical tests, uh, completely undermines this. You know, I would say pretty simple-minded notion that workers are somehow paid their their marginal product or their productivity. Uh, ask yourself why the top five hedge fund managers last twelve point six billion dollars. Uh, we simply don't have a good, solid uh, uh, notion of paying people what they're worth. Uh, we, we get in the ballpark, but we don't nail it. And that's one of the reasons why we need uh, what I, I think Blinder correctly characterized as modest increases in the minimum wage uh, in, in order to help uh, uh, people get a fair shake without leading to job loss. Well, great. And, and thank you very much for uh, uh, hosting the debate. Yeah, well, thank you for being on the debate. Uh, I mentioned to everyone uh, earlier in the introduction that, that he is involved with Austrian economics, which, uh, although it's called Austrian economics, to me it's the real economics. And, Dr. Block, why don't you explain to people what is Austrian economics and how is it distinct from other uh, areas in economics? Well, first of all, Austrian economics has nothing to do with the economics of the country Austria. The reason it's named Austrian economics, and you have to make that point, I think, is because the leaders of it, the founding fathers of it, Menga, Bamberg, Mises, all Hayek, all came from Austria. Similarly, you have the Chicago School of Economics after Milton Friedman and George Stigler. It's got nothing to do with the economics of Chicago. It just so happens that it started at the University of Chicago in Chicago. Now, the difference is that the main difference is methodological. Austrians see economics as a branch of logic not as a branch of empirical science. So for us, the claim that trade is mutually beneficial in the ex ante sense, which means suppose I buy a newspaper for a dollar, it means that in the anticipation sense, I value the newspaper more than a dollar, and the newspaper vendor values my dollar more than the newspaper. Now, how are you going to test that? You really can't test that. If you understand the English language, you understand. Now, later on, well, I might regret it. I might find there was no news or something, and I regret my, my purchase. But at the time of purchase, it's absolutely undeniable, not definitional, but, but uh, apodictically true, that I value the newspaper more than the buck, and the newspaper vendor values my buck more than the newspaper. Otherwise, why are we making a deal? Now, 
for the Austrian, all of economics is like that. It's a series of axioms that you deduce and infer from. And what you do when you go out into the real world and do econometric studies, which Austrians also do, is we don't test these theories. These theories are undeniable. Rather, we illustrate them. So like, Are they like transcendent principles? Yes, that's a very good word, transcendent principles. That, that are, it's sort of like uh, geometry. I mean, the Pythagorean theorem is true um, transcendentally, and you don't test it. If it doesn't work, it shows that you don't have a triangle. Well, one so, thing I want to I, I want to get in here. It sounds like Dr. Bernstein is is Keynesian. Is he well, Keynesian? He, uh, he may well be. I, I wouldn't put it past him, but what he said about the minimum wage law it doesn't definitively tie him as a Keynesian. It just defines him, as far as I can see, as a person who uh, doesn't understand the, the functioning of the minimum wage law. Well, you see, the, the, this thing he was talking about, this controlled experiment, you know, you have two states nearby, one, one next to the other. There was a famous study of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, and they had different minimum wages, and then they had different unemployment rates for teenage or unskilled workers. Uh, other economists tried to replicate that, and they couldn't. And one of the uh, the mainstays of, of empirical studies is that other researchers should be able to replicate this. What they found was very sloppy. They interviewed people on the phone. They didn't know who they got on the phone. And they, when they tried to replicate it later, there were businesses that went broke uh, and were no longer available to be interviewed. So you didn't really have a controlled experiment. Now, now there are sort of controlled experiments, uh, like North and South Korea, East and West Germany, where you had... A lot of things that were similar, only you had a different economic system, and then you had very different results. So I'm not um, unappreciative of that. I'm just saying, if we're going to do it, let's not do it in a sloppy way. Let's do it um, in a meaningful way. And these studies are, are not meaningful. Uh, a very small proportion of all econometric studies um, are the Blinder and Stiglitz kind of studies. The overwhelming majority of empirical studies show what many economists expect, namely, the higher the minimum wage law, the more unemployment for people who have productivity levels below the, the levels stipulated by the law. Well, another point is that w one distinction between Austrian economics and, e and uh, the Chicago School with its econometrics and uh, Keynesians is that uh, the Austrian school t totally disavows central planning, whereas the other uh, uh, disciplines seem to at least advocate some level of central planning, which to me is what a minimum wage is. And, well, and also deciding to have a minimum wage uh, uh, based on these statistics or these numbers. Well, I think what you're saying is historically accurate, but, uh, but not philosophically accurate. In other words, both Austrian economics and mainstream economics, whether Chicago and or Keynesian, and Chicagoans are Keynesians, uh, is a uh, value-free science whereas uh, libertarianism is a value-laden uh, discipline. So uh, an Austrian, qua Austrian, couldn't say the minimum wage law is good or bad or just or unjust. He could just say, or she, that it has thus and such effect. Now, it just so happens that you're absolutely right that virtually all Austrians, without exception, are very free enterprise, and the Chicagoans and the Keynesians and the Marxists certainly are not. But it's not because they're speaking qua economists, because... Uh, you know, an Austrian could save a central planning, like if he was a misanthrope and hated people. He could say, look, I realize that central planning will screw up the economy, but I hate people and I want to screw up the economy, so I save <laughs> so a central planning. He, now, I don't know that there are any like that, but there could be one like that. So we have to be very careful when we're treading on philosophical thin ice. Well, why don't you tell me in the little time we have left, where do you see our economy heading right now? <laughs> Well, <laughs> thanks to uh, Dr. Bernstein's buddies in Washington, Bernanke, and uh, other central planners in Washington, D.C., it's, it's in a very, very poor state. Uh, for the Austrians, when the government creates successive money supplies or, in, or even has fiat currency as opposed to the gold standard, what they do is they create inflation and they create the business cycle by artificially lowering interest rates below the level that would otherwise obtain and thus encouraging investment in very heavy basic industries that can't be sustained based on the savings and consumption decisions of the, uh, of the populace. In addition, what they did uh, on the housing market and, and the, um, what's that, the, the corn market with oil? Oh, uh, the commodities? They, uh, you know, they're making uh, corn into fuel 